Let's talk quickly about the differences in tolerability as we've talked about. We all sort of know this and you can see here they're sort of listed from kind of best on the top down to worst and this is not necessarily surprising and we kind of talked about this earlier so I'm going to for the sake. The concept is, as you can see, they vary greatly. And sometimes this is very important. If you have somebody who's already overweight and has diabetes, let's say, you might be especially careful with using one of the high-risk drugs. Uh, Parkinsonism, drug-induced Parkinsonism on the left, you can see there is a, quite a gradient here. And on the right, you can see for prolactin elevation, we know there's significant variability with, interestingly, risperidone and paliperidone. Paliperidone is the active metabolite of risperidone. And they both have very high and surprisingly higher than haloperidol at raising prolactin. And there's an interesting reason for that. But on the left, the, you can see here the ones that have lower uh, risk drug-induced Parkinson's we talked about. And then the, on the uh, lower end, the ones with the highest risk, dominated by the first generation in psychotics. And that's actually the raison d'etre, if you will, for atypicals was they were atypical in that they had lower risk of drug-induced movement disorders. Yeah, so the bottom line, these forest plots tell us there's tremendous variability in terms of adverse events or tolerability, not so much with efficacy. Yeah. So we're going to select drugs, assuming that they work, also trying to fit it in to what the patient wants to avoid and what they can live with, what yeah. they've experienced, what they didn't experience, and so on. So that's the art of medicine. It's an excellent point. And I do think we pick our medicines uh, often based on side effect profile and risk matching to the patient. And not as much indication, but as we know that these drugs, based on the different receptor binding, they have different properties. Some of them, for instance, may be more sedating or calming. So maybe if I have a more overactivated, agitated patient, I might choose that. Some may be more activating, energizing. And so if I have a slower down lethargic patient, maybe negative symptoms, I might do that. So I think that's kind of how we do things. Because on average, there's nothing to tell us this drug's better than another, although we know for any given patient, some will do better with one than the other. We just don't know who they are yet. <laughs> So let, let's think through this for, for a moment. Oh, yes, the glucose and triglycerides, so certainly. This story? Let me just finish yeah. this story, yeah. So uh, quickly here what you see is they, they significantly differ not only on weight gain, but on glucose and triglycerides, which are related but also independent in some ways. You can see disruption of metabolic without significant weight gain. And so here you see the gradient there. So we'll move on. Well, a little bit more about weight gain. This is where I can think of the branded products as offering something different for me yeah. to offer my patients. Yeah. So cariprazine is a branded antipsychotic that I can use for patients with schizophrenia. So is lumateparone. And they are both more friendly in terms of weight and metabolic effects. There's also a lanzapine samidorphin combination, mm -hmm. yep. which allows me to use a lanzapine yep. with less weight gain than otherwise would have been expected with the use of a lanzapine alone. If we were giving this talk two years ago, I would win hands down. But since lorazidone went generic, you do have now in your camp That's true. a relatively uh, low weight gain drug. But not everyone is going to respond to lorazidone, and That's not true. everyone can remember to take it with food and That's so on. True. There's all sorts of other issues. Yep. I like having new choices, and I do reach for them when I need to, yep. which is more often than I would have thought. You know, now, my bias, and maybe I'm a bit of a homer, my bias is a drug company would not spend all of the money it takes now and go through all the trouble to get a drug approved unless there was some potential, uh, it, not advantage, but something about it. And very often these newer ones do have certain safety or tolerability advantages, I find. Yeah. So as you can see, this is not much of a debate. We're both very agreeable with each other. A little well, you should have seen us behind the scenes rehearsing, though. It was a catch Yeah, no, it's, yeah. 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 <laughs> So a bit more about weight gain. What you need to remember is that all antipsychotics are associated with weight gain. It's more pronounced in antipsychotic naive patients. It can occur over time, and it's not clearly dose dependent. Antipsychotic related weight gain is polygenic. Some people are predisposed to developing it, but we don't have a test to know who. Yeah. But we can differentiate amongst our choices based on group data. 
which ones are more likely to be associated with weight gain than others. So we have that list. And I go to that list if someone is very worried about weight gain or who has demonstrated weight gain already with antipsychotics. Yeah. The bottom line, though, is your individual mileage may vary. Mm -hmm. So you need to be nimble here. <laughs> I've used olanzapine from the get-go, no. and I've had success with olanzapine with no weight gain That's right. with not some of my patients. Not everybody gains weight. That's yeah. right. So you just never know. But you need to be flexible and be able to pivot should problems occur. Can I just go back though? There's a bullet there I want to emphasize sure. that I'm glad you wrote the way you did. It is not clearly dose dependent. In my clinical experience, it certainly can be dose dependent, particularly for drugs with high affinity for the H1 histamine receptor.